And so today we have here to speak with you Eva Schloss. She was born in Austria. She migrated to Belgium and the Netherlands uh, to escape the Nazi takeover of Austria. She settled in the Netherlands, and when she was in the Netherlands, she met Anne Frank. She was arrested, Eva, on her 15th birthday and was sent to Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. Anne Frank didn't survive Auschwitz, but Eva did. Since 1985, Eva has dedicated herself to the subject of Holocaust education. She's the author of three books, she's done over a thousand speaking engagements, and she's here to speak with us today. She also became Anne Frank's stepsister posthumously. Uh, Eva's mother married Anne Frank's father in 1953. In addition to Eva, we also have Daryl Klott with us today. Daryl Klott is also a Holocaust educator, and she'll be facilitating the discussion with Eva. Daryl has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from UW-La Crosse. Uh, she had a career as a public school instructor in Minnesota, and then when she retired, she really went to work. She first developed an interest in the Holocaust, a professional interest, as a teacher in Minnesota. Since then, she studied with Holocaust scholars in Poland and in Israel. She directs workshops for other Holocaust educators, and she teaches the history of the Holocaust at Viterbo University. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome both of our speakers today, and if you could give me a hand in, in welcoming them on stage. Thank you. Eva, let's begin with the topic of Hitler. Anything, anybody who knows anything about the Holocaust, I think, is always in shock that this man was able to gain the kind of power that he did. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Um, yes. Uh, well, you know, we are always puzzled about how a man like Hitler, an uneducated Austrian, was able to get power in Germany, a very educated public, highly educated public, and um, to perhaps get a little bit of understanding, we have to really go back to the uh, end of the First World War uh, in, the, in 1918, which uh, Germany, of course, was defeated, and um, the Allied French, uh, uh, France, England, and America put horrible conditions, peace uh, conditions, onto Germany. And it was very humiliating for Germany, and besides that, Germany became extremely poor, something you can't imagine. Um, there was an enormous inflation, there was starvation. Um, people had to go with a wheelbarrow of a paper bunny, which was practically worthless to buy a loaf of bread, and the next day it was uh, again much, much worse. Um, about several million marks was one dollar. And um, there was starvation, there was unemployment, and um, the many governments, the Weimar Republic was one, started to do something to improve situations, but nobody succeeded. So then came a man and he said, here's a solution, he's going to put things right. Well, people said, we um, have nothing to lose, let's give him a chance. And um, he got into power, and one of the things which everybody liked was, you know, if there's such poverty, then, of course, as another party becomes very powerful, and that is the uh, communists. So there were street fights in, in the streets in all big towns, communists against Nazis, and the world, including America, England, the church, Vatican, everybody was more afraid of communism than of the National Socialist Party. That is really very, very important. And so people said, well, let um, government said, let Hitler come to power, he's going to fight communism, which he, which he did. Um, the first uh, concentration camps were actually built for communists. So, and Hitler uh, started to build the uh, autobahn, the motorways, was the first one in Europe. As well, um, he promised everybody would have a car, a well-known Volkswagen, a Beetle, car for the people. And, um, so there was work, uh, 
there was food and things started to be better. So people went along with them. There were even Jews who tried to um, join the National Socialist Party. Of course, very soon they were thrown out there. And to get more um, people to follow him, because not everybody followed, of course, um, he became um, extremely anti-Semitic and said the fault of why we have been so, um, uh, why we lost the war and all that is because of the Jews. And um, again, people went along with this. And this is how the Holocaust started. But at first, Hitler didn't want to get rid of, um, um, kill Jews. He just wanted to get rid of them. So there were big negotiations with Eichmann. He was the one who came up with the final solution later. Um, he went to uh, Palestine to um, have conferences with the Mufti of Jerusalem. He uh, was sort of the President Mufti, you called him. Um, if uh, they could ship all the German Jews, Austrian Jews, to Palestine. But of course, they didn't want them. Then they came up to send um, the Jews to um, Africa somewhere and all kind of ideas. But um, no plan was really, really plausible. And so then later, in 1941, they had the Wannsee Conference. They decided on the final solution. So, um, and this is really how the Holocaust came to be. You <clears throat> lived with your family, your father, Poppy, Pappy, and your mother, who you called Muti, and your brother, Heinz, had a happy family life in Vienna. And then you were forced to move to Brussels and then on to Amsterdam. Could you talk about those years, please? Um, well, I was born in 29, just when the Depression started. But um, Austria, of course, felt it as well. But um, nevertheless, we were a middle-class family. We had actually a very um, happy and good life. We had a big extended family with cousins, grandparents, aunts, uncles. And um, I was a very sporty child. Uh, I liked the outdoor life. I liked uh, skiing in winter, mountaineering in summer. And in, this, in um, summer, we went uh, first always to Italy, to the seaside. And it was really a beautiful life. I had an older brother. Um, I should really have been the boy, and he's a girl. I was a tomboy, and he was very, very gentle. He was an artist. At um, four years old, he could play already piano. Um, he read books all the time. And at night, um, he came into my room and told me all the stories he had read. So for me, there was no need to learn to read, and I didn't really want to read. I read my first book, actually, when I was 13. And um, my parents always said, I'm a late developer, which I really was. Um, but um, in uh, March 1938, um, the terrible thing happened. The Nazis just marched into Austria. And um, the Jews um, were very, very scared, because we knew what had happened in, in Germany already, and the Austrians overnight became ardent Nazis. It was amazing, amazing. All our best friends, Catholic people, suddenly stood in the street with the swastika flag, with the Heil Hitler salute. And um, right away, the next day, Jewish people were pulled out of their home, beaten up, their shops were looted. And um, overnight, the whole atmosphere changed. That was the first time I'd experienced anti-Semitism. Um, in, in Germany and Austria, you had to have religious education. So uh, Austria was a Catholic country, so um, the Catholic children stayed in their classroom, and the Jewish children, I think there were about seven in our class, were taken out, and we had Jewish education in a different classroom. It was perfectly right, nobody minded. But after the Nazis came in, suddenly we were the enemy. And um, my best friend was Catholic. And um, after school, I usually popped in there. But after the uh, invasion of the Nazis, um, the mother saw me coming. And she um, said, we will never want to see you here again. And she slumped the door in my face. My brother was 12 years old. He came home. He was all beaten up and um, blood streaming from his nose, from his mouth. And when my parents questioned him, he said, my own friends beat me up, and the teachers were there watching it. So this was the situation. 
So you can imagine that most people tried to leave the country. Um, but that wasn't so easy. You had to have an exit visa, you had to have an entry visa, a country who welcomed you. And um, by 1938 and then later 39, it was practically impossible to get a visa in anywhere in the world. Um, my father was lucky, he had businesses in, in the Netherlands, and I think the next second day he left on a business trip. And he said, as soon as I'm settled, I um, ask for you to follow. By the time he was ready for us to receive us, um, the Dutch had closed the borders as well for Jewish immigration. President Roosevelt had a meeting in France in 1936 already and um, invited all the countries, uh, the representatives of the countries, and um, the meeting was how many Jews are they going to let in. And it was practically nothing. So, um, and Hitler knew that, and so he really realized later on if he was going to kill the Jews, nobody was going to lift a hand or object. And that is really what happened. So, um, we were desperate to get out. In the meantime, already many people had been arrested and deported even to, it was called resettlement, meaning they were taken to Polish ghettos, and once the ghettos were full, they were just uh, executed. So, but at that time we didn't quite know this, but we re desperately wanted to leave. And um, we heard that you could go illegally over the border to Belgium. You might know that it's similar how the Mexicans tried to come into your country now. Um, but once you were there, um, they let you stay. So we did that. And um, we lived in Brussels. Of course, we couldn't take anything with us. We lived in a little boarding house. I had to go to a friend's school, and um, nobody took any notice. I was looked at as, you know, a strange person. Um, refugees was something which was not well known at the time. You know, most people stayed in their own countries. So um, people didn't really know what to do with me. Nobody helped me with the language, and I became very shy and, and sad already. And. Um, <clears throat> My father tried desperately to get a visa for us. In the meantime, Hitler um, was not happy just with Austria. He went into Czechoslovakia, and again, the Allied just didn't move. But um, then he started to attack Poland, and um, France had a pact with Poland. If uh, Poland was attacked, the French would have to go into war. And England had a pact with France, so England and France declared war on Hitler. But um, there was war, but there was no fighting because there was no common border. So nothing really happened at that time. Um, but my father was afraid, um, he still lived in the Netherlands and we in, in, in Belgium, that they would close the border and we won't be able to get together again. And he had been trying all the time to get a visa for us. And eventually in um, February 1940, we succeeded to get a visiting visa for us to come to um, Amsterdam. And it took a furnished apartment on a sort of a triangle um, where there was a big open space in the middle. And um, when you live in apartments, you have no yards where you can play. So all the children of this neighborhood came on this big uh, open place to play. And, um, I was 11 by that time, and one day a little girl came to me and um, introduced herself and said her name was Anne Frank. And um, we became friends. Anne was not in the same school. We would have been in the same class. She was in the Montessori school. That's sort of, um, have you heard of Montessori teaching? Yes. Um, I think people get more attention, the classes are smaller. And um, Anna's older sister didn't go in the Montessori school. So obviously Otto must have realized that Anna is a bit different, needed perhaps more attention. And it was true, she was a very big chatterbox. She loved talking, loved drawing attention to herself. And um, the nickname was Mrs. Quack Quack, because she never stopped talking in class. Very often she had to stay behind and um, write 100 lines I'm not going to talk so much in class, but she still did. 
<laughs> and um, on our square, um, she always tried to be the center of attention. She tried to attract a lot of kids and um, was telling stories. And I was still quite shy. And um, she was, um, I was more a tomboy. I liked to play grounders with a boy, like it's your baseball. And I was very good. I was always chosen as one of the first to be in their group. But Anne was, um, never did anything like that. She was very interested in uh, her hairstyle, in clothes. She always had pictures of film stars, and as well at, on boys already with 11. When she heard that an older brother, uh, I grew very big and asked when she could come and visit us. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we knew each other for two years. And um, we were settled down, but we were afraid after three months we might have to leave. But um, there was no need to because in May 1940, so just about three months when we were there, um, one night we heard uh, aeroplanes and, and guns, and we put on the radio, and the announcer said, terrible news, the Germans are try trying to invade our country. You know, at the First World War, the Dutch, it's um, lying under sea level, and they just opened the dikes, and the Germans couldn't get in and bypass it. So Holland was not in the war in the First World War. And that's what they assumed again. They said, yeah, we are not an important country. Hitler won't be interested in us. But Hitler wanted to conquer, really, the, conquer the whole of Europe, which he succeeded. And um, so there was a very short five-day war and um, the Dutch queen uh, with her family escaped, uh, first to England, later to Canada, which was very depressing for the Dutch people. And as well, um, that was the first time a civilian city had been bombed in that war. In the Spanish War, Civil War, of course, many, many cities had been bombed. It was horrific. But in this war, that hadn't happened yet. And that was Rotterdam with 3,000 casualties. And after five days sort of fighting, the Dutch gave up. And we still tried to escape to um, England by boat. But when we got to the harbor, it was too late. So we realized we were trapped. And then <clears throat> you ended up going into hiding for two years. Pappy and Heinz were separated to a different place, you and Muti. Could you just talk to us about what it was like being in hiding for two years? Well, I just have to tell you a little bit why we had to go into hiding. Um, you know, the Germans wanted to really catch all the Jews in Europe, and, um, but they didn't want to um, alienate the Dutch population. So the first few months, nothing really happened. But then very slowly, slowly, they started to take measures against the Jewish population with um, confiscating our bicycles, for instance. Um, uh, we were not allowed on public transport. We were not allowed to have radios. We were not allowed to visit Christians in their homes. They were not, so they tried to keep us separate from the ordinary uh, Dutch population. And all through this, of course, the um, Dutch and everywhere in the occupied country, they formed a resistance movement. Those were people who hated to be occupied by the, uh, a foreign country, by the Nazis. And um, they did all kinds of things. They shot particularly bad Nazis. They blew up trains. Um, they printed ration books. Um, and then later, they were going to help Jewish people who were being picked up and taken to the death camps. And they were um, offering to hide people like that. So this is what happened to us. In um, 1942, so after two years of occupation, about 10,000 young people, most of you would have been included if you would be Jewish, would um, got a call-up notice to um, be deported to Germany to work in German factories. And um, many people sent their children, their young people. And um, they never, ever heard from them because they never went to Germany to work in factories, but they were sent to Mauthausen, which is a horrific Austrian death camp, and they were just thrown down from the cliffs there. But we didn't know that at the time. But nevertheless, many, many parents decided 
They wouldn't send their children, but we would go into hiding. Our father called us together and said, um, Heinz is not going, and um, the only way is of um, avoiding that is to go, it's sort of going underground. And um, I've done some research, and there are some wonderful Dutch people, non-Jews, who we don't know them yet, who offered that they would keep us. But nobody, he told us, we have to separate again. Um, I will go with Mutti, and he will go with Heinz. And I didn't want to be separated. And then I cried. I said, no, I want to stay together. And my father said, well, first of all, we don't find a hiding place for poor people. But as well, if we go two in one place, there's a bigger chance that at least two of us will survive. So that was the first time when I realized it's not just sort of hiding, but it is really a danger to our life. And that was for a 13-year-old really quite frightening. So um, we, we separated and we went to um, our different hiding places. And the Germans wanted to, it's really amazing, they wanted really to catch every Jew in all the occupied countries. Everywhere the same thing had happened. And so they knew they sent out 10,000 um, notices, but only about 5,000 young people appeared. So where are those other 5,000? We really want to get them as well. So um, in the night, was always at night, they um, came with trucks in all the roads, knocked on doors. The ordinary Dutch people had to open the door, had to let them in, had to let them search their homes, and um, looking for Jews. So in every hiding place we had, um, the people from the resistance again came to look over their apartment and decided where would be a place where when they come in, we could hide. So um, in the one place where we were for a long time, there was um, the main, uh, there were two floors in the apartment, and upstairs were so tiny little rooms and a little bathroom. And um, there was a long room with a, a wash basin and a bath, and at the end was a toilet. And they made a false partition um, with a trap door in the middle and tiled it. And so when they would come, the Nazis, we would quickly go in there. And um, they finished on a weekend, and in the night they came already to search us, for us. And we were very lucky, it was all ready and cleaned up so they didn't find us. But if this happens many times, you can imagine people became scared, and so we had to change very often hiding places. I think we were in about seven different places. Some just several weeks, some several months, and one or two even, even longer than that. It was just um, you and Mooty. What on earth did you do all day? Did, did she teach you? Um, you must have been I, bored. As I told you, as I told you uh, I didn't like reading or writing. I was pretty bad at school, and, and especially going through first uh, in Austria, then in French, then in Dutch. It was really very difficult, and um, didn't read in what language, you know, I wasn't good in any languages, and my mother tried to do homework with me, but you don't take it very easily from your mother. I know you have in America um, homeschooling, but um, just one-to-one, -one, it just didn't work. I was a very bad pupil, my mother lost her patience, and I started to cry, and she, oh, it was, it was not, it didn't really work, so we gave that up. And um, so what did I do? I sat there, fiddling my thumb, complaining, looking miserable. Um, we were not even allowed to move because neighbors might hear you move, and then they might think they're burglars and they would call the police. So we just had to sit still the whole day. That for a person who is very active was really terrible. And the nights, we were always afraid. So I thought this is already the worst which can happen. But when we started to go into hiding, our parents said, well, a couple of months. The war, when especially when America came in in 41, everybody thought it will be a matter of a few months. But um, America didn't really fight in Europe. They had to fight the war in Asia. So, um, you know, the war lasted six years. So, um, after, yeah. So you. 
were in hiding for two years, and on your 15th birthday, May 11th, you were betrayed and sent to Auschwitz. Can you talk about that experience? Um, we had just moved again to a different hiding place. My father had phoned my mother a few weeks before. Um, the woman where they were staying is blackmailing them for more money. You had to pay something, but you know, not outrageous, like you know, for the food and for the laundry and things like that. But this woman wanted to make money out of it. And um, after two years in hiding, our resources had more or less dried up. We just had uh, still a bit of jewelry left, which my father sold through the resistance. And um, <clears throat> so um, it was in, in 44, it was already very difficult to find safe places. The Dutch um, non-Jewish people, young men, were picked up as well in the street to go to work in Germany. Uh, that was called forced labor. Um, and many, of course, my, most of them didn't want to go, as you can imagine. So they went already into hiding. Many people had been arrested and taken to camps, non-Jews. And so it took my mother perhaps three weeks till a Dutch nurse came forward and said she knows a safe place. But it turned out she was really a double agent. She really worked for the Nazis. Just to tell you an example what kind of people those were, her boyfriend was a, really a member of the resistance. And he came to her all the time and said, I need a hiding place for a family. I need a hiding place for a child. And she always had a hiding place. And sometimes he wanted to get in touch with those people whom she was taking to the hiding places. And she said, no, no, you can't, you can't, it's impossible. And so he started to become suspicious of her, and she realized that. So she renounced him, her own boyfriend, and um, he was shot on the spot. So, um, and in that house where she um, put all those people who she said it was safe, um, more than 200 Jewish people were betrayed. We heard that only, of course, after the war. And um, this place was just my father and brother, their last place had been out in the country. And um, so this place happened to be very near where we just had moved to. And on a Sunday afternoon, we went to visit them. And they followed us so that they know where we, who, where we were. And on Tuesday morning, on my birthday, we were going to have a special birthday dinner because there was really very little food. Um, we um, heard a knock on the door, and the Nazis stormed in and arrested us. And there was no way out. My mother still tried to say that we are not Jewish, or, but they knew who we were, so we were taken away. And um, within um, three days, we were already put on transport um, to the east. Holland is the most western country, and the east meant death camps, because the BBC the British Broadcast Corporation sent broadcast out to all the occupied countries in their own language. And I know in Dutch, so you were not supposed to listen to foreign broadcast, um, most people did because they had to know what really happens in the war. Um, the Germans only told the victories, they never had any defeats, which of course by 40 to 44 was not at all the case. But the British of course told. and. We always listened to it very softly. And um, I remember very clearly they told the progress of the war, but they told as well about the 300 concentration camp and death camps in Germany, Austria, and Poland. And Auschwitz was always mentioned as the biggest, the worst, where there were guest chambers where Jewish people were systematically guessed. So they never told us where we were going. We were traveling in cattle trucks, sort of good trains, metal. Um, there was just a little slit of air and um, two buckets, one with water, the other one, other one for using for toilets. So you can imagine for 100 people, one bucket. Um, once a day, um, the doors were sl slit open, and um, they threw bread out of a bucket, they threw bed, um, chunks of bread, like you would feel, feed wild animals. So already a terrible degradation. 
Um, while we were in the cattle truck, the last conversation I had ever with my brother, he told me, as I told you, he was a musician, but in hiding, of course, he had to be very quiet. So uh, he wanted to do something else, occupy himself, and he started to paint. And he created some amazing oil paintings. And he told me before they escaped from this woman who blackmailed them, he hits a painting under the floorboard in that house with a note on it. This belongs to Heinz and Eric Geringer, and after the war, he's going to come and pick it up again. And he told me, you'll be amazed what I've um, achieved. And um, after a horrible journey, um, the train stopped, and the doors were rolled open, and um, it was a beautiful May day. And we looked around, and we saw we were on a platform, and it said Auschwitz, Auschwitz in Polish. And it was a smallish Polish little town where the German had used the land around it as a huge, huge, about 10 square miles of death camps. There were many camps. Auschwitz was the name of the town, so that's why the Disney is known. But there was Birkenau, which was a women's camp, which was actually much bigger and much more horrible. And then there was Monoway, which was a work camp. Um, the gas was produced as well there, um, by inmates even. And um, there were some work camps there as well. And after people had become too ill and too weak um, to be work in the work camps, there were guests in Auschwitz. And um, so the first command was um, men and women to different sites. So you can imagine what a farewell that was. Fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, kissing, screaming thinking perhaps that is the last time they will ever see each other on earth. Um, and then um, the men walked away. Then appeared um, a very, very nice, clean um, officer, uh, polished boots, white gloves, and um, youngish men, and everybody, the other inmates who were there, um, we, we heard them whisper, Dr. Des, Dr. Des, Mengele. He was a camp doctor, doctor, a real doctor, medical doctor, but he decided who was going to live and who was going to die. So the first selection was taking place. We had to stand in rows of five. He looked you over, and he, like a conductor, he conducted you this direction or this direction. About half hour transport, um, any children, babies, older looking people, they didn't ask the age, it just depended how you look, um, went to one side. My mother and me, luckily, went to the right side. Then we were marched into the camp, into a huge, huge barrack. The first command, undressed completely naked, and the SS were walking around laughing at our embarrassment, as you can imagine. Um, one shock after the other happened. Um, <clears throat> um, our head was shaved. Then we were tattooed. We were told, you are not a human being, you are like cattle who gets a number. If ever we want you, you were only being called out by the number. It was all degradation. And while this was happening, it took many, many hours. They told us that the family you've been separated from were told to have a shower, and um, they went in there. Um, expecting water to come. There were pipes and shower heads. Nothing happened, no water, not a drop of water. And they waited and waited, and they started to have breathing difficulties, um, started to feel faint, and within 10, 12, 15 minutes, everybody had fallen to the floor and were, were dead. And the Germans looked through little holes on the roof, and when everybody, nobody moved anymore, um, other inmates had to come and take out the dead bodies. And that was called the Sonderkommando, Special Work Unit. And those people who did that job knew that within three weeks it was their turn. That was the system it worked. So can you imagine how those people felt taking out bodies knowing in three weeks there would be a body like that? 
So, and they told us that this <coughs> laughing, with pleasure, when people who had just lost their child started to cry and to scream, they just, ha, 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 ha. Ah, yeah, well, you will be burning soon, too. The cruelty, you know, the pleasure of hurting us was just unbelievable. Um, you know, they say always later they had to do their duty, but that wasn't duty, that was sadism. They really tried to make life more and more unnecessarily difficult for us. So eventually we were taken out, still naked, and they were huge, they confiscated everything, every transport, everything you wore, everything was taken away from you. And um, um, so we had to parade naked in front of huge heaps of clothes and we were thrown one garment, whatever was on this heap. It could have been a winter coat, could have been a nightdress, whatever. And then the next heap were shoes. Again, we were thrown two shoes, which was of course never a pair, never anything but fitted. And that was all our possessions we ever had. We had not even a piece of toilet paper, not any underwear or anything like that. You were at Auschwitz for eight months. Could you talk about daily living conditions, including food, your work camp experiences, that type um, of thing? Um, after, we came, after we had our possessions, we were taken to a barrack which was low buildings, which on both sides, so there were sort of, you might have seen pictures of that, sort of three high, like cages, um, wooden structures with nothing in it. And 10 people had to crawl into one of those cages. And um, that is was where we slept. Um, as I say, there was nothing in it. The only thing which was in this woodwork was bed bugs and lies. So within, Days we were covered in lice, not just head lice, but body lice. And the itching and the filth which is, was just unbelievable. In the morning, early, we were called out. There were about 500 people in every barrack, and there was a roll call. We had to stand in rows of five this way, um, in front of the barrack, and the whole camp was counted, which took usually two hours. If um, the number didn't uh, it wasn't correct what they thought because it happened very often that in the night somebody in a bank had died and wasn't reported. So then the whole camp had to be recounted. We took another um, two hours. So, and we had to stand not moving at all. If you kind of, if they saw you moving or um, crouching down because it's very tiring to stand, especially later when we were so exhausted. Um, you were really beaten very, very hard. And um, when eventually that was finished, we got our breakfast with, with a mug with some kind of liquid. And then we were picked for work commandos, which um, varied from day to day. Um, sometimes we had to carry huge boulders. Sometimes what's one of the worst jobs we had to empty with a little mug, the latrines, because they were just big holes which didn't go anywhere, and we had to empty that and take it somewhere else. Can you imagine without washing afterwards? Washing was practically non-existing, so you can imagine how s smelly and stinky and disgusting and full of germs we were. <laughs> that not everybody got typhus and dysentery and cholera immediately is a miracle, but many, many people got those illnesses, of course, which could be cured with um, treatment and medication, but there wasn't. So many people perished in this way. Many people starved to death because you can't exist very long on this little food. What about your work in Canada and the things you found as you were carrying yeah. that out? Um, when we arrived in Auschwitz in May, um, the Hungarian Jews who had been free till then because uh, Hungary was not occupied, but was an ally of Germany, um, was occupied then um, by the Germans in 1944. And all the Hungarian Jews were picked up. And every day, transport of thousands of those people arrived. And there was one place in um, Birkenau where um, all these belongings which those people brought had to be sorted. Because, you know, Germany was bombed by the Allies and many, many 
people lost all their belongings, and everything the Jews were bringing into the camps was uh, sorted and shipped to Germany, clothes, suitcases, glasses, shoes, um, whatever you can, a suitcase, whatever you can imagine, was um, taken to the German population. But we had to, um, and I was picked to work there for three weeks while those Hungarian transport arrived. And um, we had to, um, one of my jobs was to open all the hems of dresses and coats and jackets because many, many people, um, when they were arrested or known they were put on transport, um, hid their jewelry, money, uh, any valuables um, there, um, thinking perhaps they can bribe their way out to freedom. And we found really watches, we found diamond rings, we found gold coins, cigarettes, and as well a lot of food. So this was three weeks I worked there, and that was not so bad, you know, that certainly helped me to survive. I've heard this, and to me, the, the, the saddest thing is she would tell about finding not, not treasures, but what they turned out to be treasures to people, the little photos of their families. With people, you know, that were some so people, in. only yeah. things they did bring along was family. Um, and very often I saw family of a lovely smiling baby no knowing that this child had already been guest. We can't even imagine, can we? You were at the doorstep of death at Auschwitz, and yet you had miracle after miracle. Could you just talk a little bit about some of those, please? Um, time went on. You know, every day was the same. We didn't know what day of the week it was. There was no Sunday, and we didn't even know the months. Um, we only knew really the season when it started to be cold, it became autumn and then winter. And in autumn, so it could have been October, I suppose, or I don't know, um, we, had, we went to a shower, occasionally went to a shower. It, it was called, you were deloused because we were so full of lies. And um, they didn't really want us to be so loud because it jumped, of course, as well on the, on the guards that they didn't want to be um, plagued by that. So time to time we were deloused. And um, we came out of the shower and um, Mengele, this doctor with his SS guard, stood there and the selection was taking place. It happened from time to time. And um, I passed, had to turn around in front of Mengele. Then my mother followed behind me and um, he looked at her and like, and she was quite tall and she had become, I must say, really very, very thin already because very often she had given me part of her bread ration. And um, he looked at her and decided she was not fit anymore for work and he put her with about 40 other women from our group aside and those women marched naked out um, into a barrack where they were waiting to be taken to the gas chambers. So. Um, I thought I'd lost my mother. And through a miracle, she was saved. And after about three months, we were reunited. But you know, this was really amazing. Um, it's a long story. I can't really explain it to you so quickly. But um, in Eva's story, my first book, which I wrote in 88, my mother was still alive. And she describes exactly what has happened. She was 40 years old at the time. and. Um, she had accepted that that would be the end of her life. She only prayed that her children would survive. And um, she was saved through a miracle, and we were reunited again. And after that, they had an, she had another 53 years of life. So, you know, and it could have been finished for her. And very happy, happy years, married 27 years of it with Otto Frank. And it was a very, very happy marriage. So, um, but her life could have been cut short. In uh, Jan well, on January 27th, 1945, the Russians liberated Auschwitz. How did you end up finding Otto Frank? Um, you know, one day, um, the, the German um, took, took every day people out of the camp, but they knew, we didn't know, 
that the Russians are fighting their way in um, into Poland and were soon going to come to Auschwitz. And they didn't want um, Jewish people to be freed. And as well, they themselves, the, the guards, were very afraid of the Russians. So they many escaped, and it became not so strict anymore. You could move around more. There was no work and no guards, really. And um, so the camp had become quite small. And um, one morning, we woke up. And it was very, very quiet. We got outside, and the, all the Nazis, with most of the inmates, had disappeared in the night. And um, we were for about 10 days on our own. And um, many people died at that time. And we couldn't bury them because we had no tools, and there was, there was ice. So I was one of the few people who could still carry the bodies. So we had to heap them up outside the barrack. So that was a a job and a sight which I will never get out of my head. Terrible, really terrible. And um, one day we walked around again, you know, not knowing. We could have gone, the gate was open, but we were weak, it was cold, we didn't know what were the Polish people, were they helping us, were they killing us? Because it was, you know, the Poles knew there was this camp. Never had anyone thrown a piece of bread over the fence or helped anybody. So we just stayed put. And um, at the gate, uh, one day, I saw a huge creature all uh, with, covered in fur and with ice and icicles hanging on him, because it was unbelievable cold. And from the distance, I thought first it was a bear. But when I looked closer, I realized it was a, a, a huge man. It was a scout from the Russian to, uh, in, to find out what was going on before the army followed. And after another few days, the uh, army came and um, <coughs> with horses, with field kitchens, with guns, with um, cannons, all kinds of things. And they made um, the states the night there and they put the field kitchen up and they fed us. Um, but they ate as well. Wonderful. The smell when they cooked it drove us already mad. You know, we hadn't had any proper food for months and months. And um, it was cabbage soup, very, very greasy with a piece of fat in it. And it was just delicious. And they gave us big um, bowls with it. And we ate and ate and ate. But I've never spent a more painful night on a bucket <laughs> because the food went straight through me. And um, I realized I have to be very, very careful. And in the morning, Many people had died from overeating. The body just didn't have the strength to digest the food. So um, we had to be very, very careful. And then I decided, and they left again. I decided I would go to the men camps, Auschwitz, to see if I could find my father and brother. And I went there, and um, there were as well about three, four, five hundred <coughs> men left behind. The others had all been taken out. and. Um, I saw two people who I'd known in um, Amsterdam. And um, I went to one. And I, I, he looked familiar, but I didn't really know. And um, it turned out to be Otto Frank and his father. We didn't know that the family had been in hiding. We didn't know that they had been betrayed. We didn't know that they had been taken to Auschwitz. And the first question, Otto, of course, asked me if I had seen his family, his girls, or his wife and I hadn't seen them. And I asked him if he had seen my father and brother, and he said, yes, they were here, but a um, few days ago they left with the Germans. So that was actually good news, because I thought, um, well, the war will be finished, perhaps in a few weeks, and um, they would be alive, and we would be reunited again. It took you and your mother five months to get back to Amsterdam. Could you talk about that experience? And also, Otto Frank was as well. As well, all 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 the women who were liberated, and not the Polish people, because they were able to get back to their country if they were in their country. But all the people from the West were looked after by the Russians. We were put in trains, and they moved us eastward because we couldn't get back home yet. So um, we travelled four months with the Russians every day traveling, and um, we saw unbelievable devastation. 
The Germans had burned down every town, every village, every field. It was just, just nothing left. And um, people came crawling out of the rubble and um, came to see us transport because they had lost people and they thought perhaps family will come. They all had photos showing us. There were a lot of Jewish soldiers as well who we met who was traveling towards the front. They too wanted to know some of their family had been picked up and wanted to know if we had perhaps seen anybody. But the interesting thing was they had always photos of their family in their pockets and always of Stalin. And they always kissed the photos and that Stalin, Stalin, he was greatly, greatly loved and admired, which uh, sometimes it surprises us because what we knew in the West was he was a terrible tyrant, but he was a very, very good uh, general. And um, the, the way the Russian fought, you might have heard um, the siege of St. Petersburg and the battle around Stalingrad. That's a wonderful movie about it. Um, if you can, try to see it. The Russians really, you know, they, they adore their country, Mother Russia, and millions, 30, um, 30 million of Russians died in defense of their country because the war was really fought, most of the war on Russian soil. And so, you know, I have no complaints about them. There was no rape, there was no bad treatment. The feathers and, and um, and closed us, we got Russian uniforms. I still got it, doesn't fit me, of course, anymore. Much too small. Um, but it's still nice to have it. And eventually we ended up in Odessa. And there we waited for the end of the war. And when that came, of course, there was great jubilation that we had survived. And then we were keen to get back, of course, um, to the West and find out what has happened to our family. So you got back to Amsterdam, and what was very what I find very unusual is that your apartment was still there, because that was that's not the norm. No, but no. yours was there. Well, well, um, I told you we came to Amsterdam with nothing, and it was a furnished apartment belonging to a non-Jewish person who had rented it out to us, and um, it was still all there. And so when we returned, she let us back in. But all the other people who came back, um, other people had moved in, and um, so Otto Frank he had really nowhere to go. And he went to stay with Meep Gies, who was one of the helpers um, when the people were hiding, but she was as well the person who found the diary. And so Otto Frank, having nowhere to go, started coming to visit you and your mother, and your, they became reacquainted. And one day he showed up with a parcel, and it was? Um, Meep Gies found the diary, but um, wasn't going to give it to Otto when he came back, because she was going to hand it over to Anne. But only after Otto told her, after several weeks when he heard that Anne and Margot had both perished in another camp in bergen Belsen, did she give him the valuable little book. And Otto was very proud of it, and he came to our house and um, opened it as if it was gold, and um, um, showed us. And as well, he said, can I read you something? And he started to read, but um, he ne never got further than a couple of lines. He always burst into tears. It took him three weeks to read it. And then he translated it into German, to um, send it to his mother. And he was immensely proud of it. He knew, of course, that she had written a book and in her diary, but he had no idea what she had written. And he was amazed. He always used to say, you know, I didn't even know my own child. <clears throat> when did you find out that Pappy and Heinz had not, had not survived, they had perished? Um, after several weeks when we were back in Amsterdam, we got a notification from the Red Cross. Till this day, I don't know how they knew. Um, because I can't imagine that the Germans in the last day of their war, the last day of fighting, that they still kept records. But it, it, it was there, the record, and it was written 
very clearly there was a name and the birth of date. My father and my brother that both died in this terrible camp Mauthausen several days before the American army came to liberate that camp. Well, that was for us the last straw. We had survived, um, hoping we would get back to a normal family life again, but when that was shattered, I became very, very miserable and depressed and hated everybody. And then Otto encouraged you to go to London, and he gave you his Leica, Leica. camera, and, and encouraged you to go and set you up with an appointment with, with a photographer, correct? Yeah, so, um, I, I had to go first to school. I was only 16, but I had a miserable time in school. I was much older than my classmates because I had lost a few years. And um, when I finished school, I didn't know what to do with myself. And um, Otto and my mother decided I should become a photographer because I was quite artistic. And um, Otto gave me his camera, he said. He took many, many pictures of his uh, family. There is an exhibition about all those photos which are shown, very lovely. And he said, I have no family anymore. I don't want to make any photos. So here's his camera. And um, he found me a job in London um, as an apprentice for a year. And so in 1951, I went to London. And um, I lived in a little boarding house where um, a young man from Israel had come to study economics. And um, we became very friendly and we went for long walks um, because we both didn't have any money. We didn't go to theater or, or cinema and just talked about what we were doing, about our jobs and things. Never who we really were. I just told him I was Dutch and he told me he was Israeli, which was both not true. And. Um, <coughs> And um, <clears throat> after six months, he said to me, Eva, I've fallen in love with you. Will you marry me? And we can um, start a new life and go to Israel. Because he intended to go back when he was finished with his studies. And I said to him, no, thank you. Because um, I have a widowed mother in Amsterdam. And once I'm finished with this year, I was here just for a year, I'm going to go back to her. I couldn't imagine I would desert her. And um, then Otto, who kept an eye on me a little bit, um, came over one day and I told him that. And he said, um, when I told him, you know, this young man asked me to bury and I would actually bury him, but of course I'm not. So um, he said, well, your mother and me have fallen in love as well. And once you get settled, we like to get married. So I went back to this young man and said, well, you can marry me now. <laughs> and um, he was very happy. But when my mother came to meet him, she asked him not to take me so far away to Israel. And that was difficult for him because he had all his family there. He didn't know if, where he wanted to be, if he should su succeed in another country. But eventually he realized if he really wants to marry me, we have to stay in England. And that is where we still live now. And we married in 1952, and Otto and my mother a year later, 1953. And um, we have been married now for 63 years, and so we didn't know each other really. It seemed to have been a good choice because <laughs> of this long marriage. Otto's goal in life was to first publish Anne's diary and then publicize it. And your mother took that on also. And that must have been difficult for you. Didn't you sometimes feel like you were living in the shadow of Anne Frank? Um, yes, I certainly did. Um, because first of all, the diary was the very first book about anything being written and published about this um, terrible time. Of course, it is not a Holocaust story like many, many other books like Elie Wiesel or Primo Levi or many survivors um, wrote books later. But that came actually much, much later. But that was the first book when it was published in America in 1952. It became an immediate bestseller. And um, so Anne became very well known all around the world. It was translated into 70 languages. 
And uh, whenever I was introduced by Otto or by even my mother or by anybody, um, it was always, this is Anne Frank's stepsister. And I was quite upset because I said, well, I'm a person in my own right. And um, I did, um, I, I thought I was even, you know, stronger than Anne, I even survived. And um, so I, it upset me, and I was quite jealous. Why is always Anna mentioned and not me? And um, even when I wrote my first book, it was still Anna Frank's stepsister's book. And, um, and, but you know, I started to think when I started to be more myself again, um, how can I be jealous of somebody who was murdered when they were not even quite 15 years old? This poor girl didn't really have a life, so let her be famous. I have a, a husband, I've got three daughters, um, later I've got five grandchildren, so, you know, I accept that I'm just Anna Frank's stepsister. Would you share with us what you thought of the diary when you first read it? Um, well, when Otto gave it to me to read, because he wanted everybody to read it, um, I said, well, so what, you know? I wasn't impressed. I said, well, I was in hiding, and, um, and I was arrested. It's very similar for what happened to me. And um, as I told, told you, I wasn't very literate at that time. But much, much later, when I started, when it became so famous, and I started to reread it, I realized why it became so famous. Because for a little girl of 13, she had an amazing talent in writing and in observing and describing what she saw. And as well, she had, a, for a 13, 14 year old, an amazing um, uh, idea of what she wants the world to look. Um, she, had a, she writes about religion, she writes about feminism, um, about morals, and that was really quite amazing. But after Otto became my stepfather, and he started to be sort of the, the educator of our, chi our children, I realized that Anna had a lot of Otto. He was a wonderful human being, a humanitarian, and Otto, Anna and Otto, her father, were very, very close. And obviously, in the two years, being cooped up together, they must have talked a lot about all these kind of subjects with was interesting to Otto and which became interesting to Anne. So um, I really could see Otto's spirit in Anne's writing. Eva, you kept silent about your own story for 41 years, not starting to share until 1986. Why? Well, you know, I didn't want to burden our children with the suffering we had gone through. And on the same level, the children didn't want to question me. Um, what had happened is very painful if you know how your parent or your mother or your grandmother so, has suffered. So we didn't talk about it, didn't talk. And that is not just in my family, it is everywhere. And very often when I speak, a second generation person comes up to me and said, oh, I wish my mother or my father would have told me what had happened to them. Um, but now they are dead, so I will never know how they were able to survive. And that was, of course, it's a shame that we didn't speak earlier. It was as well a shame that uh, Holocaust education wasn't taken up earlier. Till the 60s, um, and even sometimes in the 70s and in the 80s, um, it wasn't taught in school. People had no idea what had really happened in the war, and certainly not about the Holocaust. And so I think we missed educating a um, couple of generations about the evil of discrimination and racism. Um, so in, um, in Amsterdam, where the Anna Frank house, where the people were hiding, um, <coughs> many, many tourists came knocking on the door wanting to see um, the hiding place. And Otto, when he was there, always showed people around. And so they decided it would become a museum. But not everybody can come to Amsterdam. So the people there, they had um, historians, made a um, traveling exhibition with um, not just the history about Anne, but as well the rise of the German Reich and the battles and the 
camps and everything. Very, very wonderful exhibitions. <coughs> and they decided um, they would travel around the world with it. But the very first one was in English and came to London in 1986. And um, of course, my mother and me were invited. And um, Otto had died. He was 17 years older than my mother. He died in 1980, um, but he was 91 years old. And um, so it was a very moving event. There were about 200 people. And um, there was a head table on the podium. And everybody <coughs> spoke about how important it is. And um, the organizer said to me, come and sit with us at the head table, which I did never expecting anything, just sit there. And um, then in the end he said, and now Eva will want to say a few words to you. I can tell you I didn't want to say anything. I wanted <laughs> to hide under the table. But um, I couldn't do that, of course. Um, so I got up, and um, everybody looked, expecting me. What is she going to talk about? And um, I just stared, and then uh, I can't, I can remember, I felt so terrible. What am I going to say? I have no clue. I've never spoken about anything, not just about the Holocaust. And there was all those people wanting me to tell them something. But eventually, um, I broke down, and I, everything I had suppressed for 40 years came flooding out. And they had difficulty stopping me. And it was really, for me, a, an amazing wonderful experience. I realized people were interested, people were desperate to know more, and it was a watershed. The exhibition traveled all over England. I was always asked to open it, which I couldn't really do. I wasn't a speaker. Um, my husband wrote a speech for me. I always had to take a tranquilizer. <laughs> and, um, and so slowly I started to find my own uh, voice. And, I must say, I haven't stopped speaking since. <laughs> you went back to Auschwitz in 1995 for the 50th anniversary of the liberation, thinking you were going to find perhaps closure? Yes, what I, happened? that's what I thought. Um, in 95, it was the 50th anniversary of the liberation, and um, the Russians were not occupying Poland anymore, and the Western countries <coughs> made a big memorial service there. And the Dutch television asked me to make a program with them there. And I was very reluctant to go, but in the end I said, well, I was 15 only, um, um, was 50 years later, perhaps I remembered it different, and I did go. But it was horrendous. So I decided I would never, ever go. But the one nice thing was that some of the Russian soldiers who had liberated the camp were there and I could say a proper thank you to them. And you were just there again. And um, <laughs> still in March um, this year, um, the, the German television asked me to do a program with them, and they're going to make a big documentary about the end of the Second World War. And I have done several programs with the German television, and um, I think for Germany, they should really learn more and know about it. So I have decided I would go again. And um, it was quite different. It was, of course, very emotional. But by now, they have sorted out all the documents which I found. And I was able to um, see the entries of my father and brother. Um, I've learned their tattoo number. I've seen the barracks where they were housed. So it was actually um, very emotional. But I learned a lot, actually. Because once you're in the camp, you don't really know what was happening outside and so on. And I've seen a lot more than when I was an inmate, and as well a lot more than when I went with the Dutch. Because we spent really a full day there, from 9 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening. We really filmed everywhere. And they just couldn't get enough of it, the, those German television crews. When I, I had, it was very, very cold. I was tired, I was hungry, I was cold. Um, I just said, well, okay, let's do this still, and let's do this still. And they were so wonderful, they were so understanding, and they cried, and so that we really did, uh, I think, a very, will be a very, very good documentary. And it is important. I learned about you 
by co-directing the play that is about you. And then they came for me remembering the diary of Anne Frank. This play is about you and Anne and a young Jewish man, uh, Ed Silverberg, living in the same neighborhood in Amsterdam. And that play has been produced all over the world. And you've been at over 500 of the performances doing Q&As. I just wondered how that play has impacted you, affected you. Well, um, when, when I was uh, uh, confronted with a playwright, I was very, very willing to do that. Because, you know, Anna Frank says in her diary, um, when she dies, she would like to live on. And, well, she has succeeded with this. And that's the most that you can. The body, of course, goes. But um, the world knows about you. You are remembered. And that is really what everybody would like to be. And my brother, I talked to you a little bit about him. Um, he was a very, very gentle boy, um, very talented. And um, when he was 12, he saw already what was happening around him. Many, many of his friends were um, taken away and kids were killed. And um, he became very much afraid of dying. And um, when he was 12, uh, he said to me one night, what will happen when we die? Will we just disappear? I'm frightened. And I said, well, let's ask our father. He has answers to everything. And we went in the morning. And Heinz said, Papi, what will happen when I die? Will I just disappear? I'm frightened. And my father said, well, of course, your body will deteriorate. But um, whatever, um, well, if you have children, you will live on in your children. And then this 12-year-old boy said, but what if I die before of any children? And my father said, well, whatever you have done, whatever you have achieved, um, whatever you've said, somebody will remember. And we are all a link in a chain which goes from generation to generation. Nothing gets ever lost. And he had to accept this. And um, <clears throat> of course, he died. And, um, very often, my mother and me said, well, nobody knows about Heinz. So I decided I would write another book, my second book, The Promise. So keeping the promise to Heinz and my father that Heinz won't be forgotten. And um, it tells about his life as well, um, many wonderful things, and as well, of course, about Auschwitz, and as well about his artwork. And as well, um, besides doing all those paintings, he wrote um, over 200 poems. Um, some are really very, very sad, but all quite with a deep meaning for a 15, 16, 17-year-old boy. It was amazing what, he, what ideas he had about life and everything. And um, in this book, I have translated a couple of his poems. I want you to share one, but I'm pretty sure everybody wants to know what happened to those paintings. He told you on the train to Auschwitz that they were under the floorboards Floor in the hiding in a hiding in, place in, in the last hiding place. What happened? Were. And um, after I must admit, after all the things which just happened to us, um, I had forgotten about the painting. But after Otto came with the diary and it helped him so much, I said to my mother, "We have to go and get Hans's paintings." We didn't really want to go there to meet with this terrible woman who had blackmailed them. But when we got there, luckily the woman wasn't living there anymore. And there lived a young couple who didn't want to believe us first that their paintings under the floorboard, didn't want to let us in, but eventually they did. And indeed, we found 30 amazing artwork which I had created. And as well, the 200 poems. And where are the paintings now? And um, a few years ago, I donated them to the Resistance Museum in Amsterdam. And they made a beautiful exhibition of it all. And of course, like all museums, you know, they have so much material, they can't display everything the whole time. It is sometimes on display, and some of the paintings are always there. And um, I think I will finish now yes. with reading one of these poems, which is um, one of the sad ones. Oops. Um, don't cry, Mama. Mama, do I have to die already? I heard the doctor say so. Please, Mama, don't cry. 
Heaven is such a, such a beautiful place and soon we'll be together again. Mama, what will my little sister say when she wants to play with me again? Please, Mama, don't cry. After all, I'll be seeing Dad again. He's been waiting up there so long already. Remember to take good care of the kitten. She loves me so. Please, Mama, don't cry. Do you still love me as much as ever? Are you still with me? Please tell me, Mama. Please hold my hand for just a minute. It seems so misty in the room. Please, Mama, don't cry. Mama, just one more thing. Please kiss me goodbye. Eva, <clears throat> despite growing up in a less than wonderful world, you have had a very successful life. You had two prosperous businesses in photography and antiques. You and Zvi have a 63-year-old marriage. You have three happy, healthy daughters and five grandchildren. And what you, you come and you share your story of overcoming obstacles. And surely every one of us sitting in this room or listening, have, we have to understand that we can persevere in our own lives and certainly overcome obstacles that we have. And we just thank you so much for coming and sharing your story with us. Thank you so much. have some questions and answers now and there's a microphone right there. It was intriguing when you said you weren't Dutch but your husband wasn't Israeli. What was he really? A uh, German but a German Jew. They were able to get out of the country in 1936 ah. going to Palestine. Okay wonderful thank you. And we were stateless. You know, first we were Austrians, then we had to become German, and then they took all our nationality away, and we were stateless. We, we never got the Dutch nationality. Did you ever get to Palestine? Um, uh, well, to Israel later, but I never lived there, no. Any other questions? Uh, well, it's a very important question, and we all, I think, we all struggle with belief. And um, I must admit, I came out of the camp an atheist, and not only didn't I believe in any God, but as well in not in humanity. Didn't believe in any beings, in any goodness in people, because I had experienced terrible, terrible things. And in the camp, the only thing what we could do was pray, and we prayed to God to stop those atrocities. And God wasn't there. So, you know, I thought, well, if, if there is a God and he sees the suffering of his people, he would have stopped it. So I came to the conclusion that there wasn't. And um, to live without any belief is very tough. And I became more and more bitter and full of hatred and I was really very unhappy who I was. So I think um, I was searching, and I think the first miracle which happened was the birth of my first daughter, because I was damaged mentally and physically, but I was still able to give birth to a child. I think that made me reconsider. But I must say, you know, I'm not fully a fully believer. I'm still searching. Um, sometimes I believe, sometimes I don't, and I question, and I have many debates with um, pastors and with priests and with rabbis and looking for an answer. And the answer is always, you mustn't question, you must believe. So, um, well, this is a mystery of life. We will never have an answer, we will never know. But um, 
I think life is easier if you have a belief. Thank you. And I think over here. Hi. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, when you told your children and you talked to them about what had happened to you, how did they react? What were their feelings? Did they not question before why you had a tattoo on your arm? Um, well, my grandson once questioned me. He said, um, Oma, what is his number? But, you know, he was small. I didn't want to tell him. I said, oh, I can't remember my telephone number. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, our girls, um, of course, then Otto was their grandfather. They knew there wasn't, it wasn't an ordinary family. They knew there was this Anne who said, didn't really understand what it was all about. But, um, you know, we just, it was just too painful to talk about it. And for them, too painful to ask us. So they didn't. And it, as I say, it's not just in my family, it's in all Holocaust survivor family. There is this silence about this terrible period. So you never talked to them about it? Only when I wrote my book in 1988, it came out. I gave it to them. It's dedicated to them. And um, I hope through reading it, they will know. And then perhaps we will talk about it. My oldest daughter took the book but said she's never going to read it. She didn't want me to know that I know and when I came to her home, it was lying open on the bedside cabinet. So she did read it, but she didn't want me to know. And she still, till now, doesn't want to talk about it. I've heard that in other people, too. Were yeah. your grandchildren interested? Yeah. With the grandchildren, we have a complete different open um, uh, situation. They ask me our... Um, one of our girls, um, who is, uh, when she was 18, in this play you have heard, she played even me in it. And uh, my youngest daughter, she is much, she, uh, much easier to talk about about this. Um, she played um, my mother. You can imagine that was a very emotional um, play for both of them. Thank you. Yes. Can you speak in there a little bit? She wants to know if you would show your tattoo. Yes, I'll show you later. It's very light, so I don't think it would no, show you up from see here. It but from the later. Uh, yes. What was your motivation to start telling your story? What was your motivation to start telling these stories? I think you sort of addressed that. Well, I was bit. kind of put on the spot. <laughs> to talk, you know. I would <coughs> never have talked if I wouldn't have been asked to talk about it. But after that, <coughs> you've been touring the world. Since, uh, since 1988, I've been non-stop speaking, actually. Uh, everywhere, everywhere. And, that, and I think that's where, where, what is the motivation for that? And, well, people, people ask me. People really want to learn. People want to know. And I hope. I can influence people a little bit. So you really are a Holocaust educator? Yeah. yeah. Big time. <laughs> yes. It died. it died. Okay. And then I'll, I'll repeat it. You, your original homeland was Austria. Why, when you were liberated, did you not try to reunite back in your homeland and ended up going back to Amsterdam instead of Vienna? Good. Good question. She said, your homeland was Austria, Vienna, and yet when you were liberated, you, try, you went back to Amsterdam, and she's wondering why you didn't try to go back to Austria, your homeland, and whatever happened to your place in Vienna. Very good, um, very good question. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, when we were um, going, when the ship came and we were to register where we wanted to go to, because, um, you know, we're from all over Europe, people were in, the, uh, in Odessa. And um, we had to register, and there was a Dutch doctor who volunteered to do this work. And when we said we wanted to go to Amsterdam, he said, but you're not Dutch, you shouldn't come to Amsterdam, you go to Austria. And my mother said, I will never set foot again in this country. They didn't want me, they threw us out, that's past. And then we hoped, because we had our 
things in, in Amsterdam that my father and brother would, that's the place where he would go when he were liberated. And um, I did go to Austria later um, quite a few times. My youngest daughter wanted to see, but my mother really never went back there. What about when you went back, I think it was with your granddaughter? On a trip, and you were tr you were going to show her oh, the uh, address with, of with this our place. With our daughter, our daughter, your daughter? Um, um, she it must be in the late seventies. We went to Vienna and Austria, and um, she wanted to see our home. And um, while I was in Vienna, the name of the street just was out of my mind. And I was every night I was thinking that's ridiculous. I know I've lived there and must know the name and it was just blocked out. The minute I got back to England, I knew it loud and sarcastic. The Austrians didn't uh, return anything. They said they were victims themselves. Um, the Germans, of course, paid a lot of um, uh, reparation to victims, gave pensions to people, and um, if you had property, um, sometimes you got the property back, sometimes it was sold and people got money for it and so on. But um, the Austrian consul in, um, in England said once we should put a claim in, which we did, but we never heard about it. Okay, we're going to take three more questions. So, um, Obviously after World War II there was a lot of turmoil in Europe, like poverty and many immigrants. But afterwards, there was quite a long period where the Iron Curtain was over much of Europe. And I was wondering how that affected your life, if at all, and how you felt when the Iron Curtain was finally lifted. You're really talking about, did the communism and the Iron Curtain af affect her at all? Yeah. Did it at all? Um, well, it didn't affect us in England, not this, but um, Germany, of course, very much so. But, um, you know, as I explained before, the consequences uh, of the poverty of Germany in the First World War, after the war, um, the Americans didn't want to make the same mistake, and you might have heard about the Marshall help, that um, Germany got, um, they didn't have to pay any war damage, on the contrary, they got a um, lot of money, they got building material, and all the help they needed to rebuild Germany. And England, as when I got in 51 in England, um, it was still all the bomb damage because England had to pay back the war uh, debt to America. I think just this year is the last payment which they were able to repay. So there was a bad uh, feeling in England. Um, you know, they said, we won the war, but the Germans, um, the most wealthy country. And now as well, you know, very often, you know, the Europe uh, um, community, um, the southern countries are all extremely poor. England too has a problem, and Germany is really the richest country uh, now of the uh, European Union. And uh, very often people say Hitler would laugh if he would know what has happened, that Germany has achieved to be the most important country in Europe. Right, what which he wanted. They, which they are now, really. Yes. Yeah, my son was going to come with, but he couldn't make it. So he sent a question. He said, in order to survive, people must have found an inner strength and even perhaps a moment of normalcy in the day just to survive. Was it possible to find a little bit of happiness or a strange sense of joy despite all of the horror around you? In Auschwitz? Yes. Her son sent this question, he wasn't able to come. You were surrounded by total degradation and horror in Auschwitz, and she, she's wondering, was it possible to find any sort of normalcy or joy while you were in Auschwitz? Very strange. Well, I can give a very short answer to that. <laughs> no, never, 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 never. And just one more really short one. He wanted to know if, if, he said, did people fall in love? Did people in Auschwitz fall in love? Well, men and women were in different camps. Yeah, they were separated. They were yes, separated. So we were not together. <laughs> no. A lot of Holocaust survivors ended up falling Afterwards. in love. Later, Afterwards. they were drawn together. Okay. For sure. Afterwards, yeah. definitely. And people didn't really want 
to marry people who hadn't suffered this similar things. Um, there are, of course, some cases, but um, it's, um, and they say it's very difficult to live with a Holocaust survivor. So we seem to be difficult people, but I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. Uh, yes. Um, if you could, what would you say to the Nazis who did this to you? If you could, what would you say to the Nazis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what would you say to the Nazis if you could meet them now? I would question them. How could they do things to that? You know, imagine um, it would happen to you. You know, we are all human beings. How can you be so cruel? Thank you. Um, we will be moving into the Bremen Theater for a, for a little meet and greet if you want to meet Eva later. I mean, like right now. And uh, let's give her another huge thank you. Thank you. Thank you.